Major funding for NJ Decides Debate Night is provided by NJM Insurance Group. Naval Academy graduate, active duty helicopter pilot, and former federal prosecutor, Democratic candidate Mikey Sherrill shattered the state's campaign fundraising record. Attorney, former chair of the New Jersey Republican Party, and five-term state assemblyman Jay Weber was endorsed by President Trump. Both running for a seat held by retiring Republican Rodney Freelinghuysen since 1995, facing off tonight with the general election just four weeks away. Live from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is the debate for the 11th congressional seat. Good evening, I'm Mary Alice Williams. And I'm Michael Hill. NJTV is honored to host this debate ahead of the November 6th midterm election. Tonight, the Republican and Democratic candidates vying for the CD11 seat, as we call it. Republican Jay Weber is an assemblyman from Morris County. Democrat Mikey Sherrill is a former prosecutor. She's from Essex County. Both of them competing to succeed the retiring Congressman Rodney Freelingheisen. Tonight's moderator, of course, NJTV News Chief Political Correspondent Michael Aaron. We've called in some key people to help us walk through the issues. Republican strategist Veronica Cleary is spokesperson for the Weber campaign. Democratic strategist Brendan Gill is an advisor to the Sherrill campaign. And director of the Monmouth University Polling Institute, pollster Patrick Murray is here as well. Patrick, first question to you. The Democrat and Republicans have seemed really dug in behind their respective candidates. Their numbers haven't changed substantially in, since June. How many undecided voters are out there who could be swayed tonight? There are very, very few true undecided voters right now. I mean, we're a month away, right? But uh, I've never seen an election that has been this dug in this early. As you mentioned, the polling that we did in the summer matches the polling that we've just, we just did a poll in this race just yesterday at Monmouth University. Same exact kind of dynamic that we've seen. It's, it's all, all the underlying fundamentals have been baked in. So what really these candidates are trying to do today is trying to really motivate their base for Mikey Sherrill's to get that Democratic base up, also to get those voters who are upset with Donald Trump, who may in the past have leaned Republican, to come out and vote for her. Uh, Jay Weber has to kind of say, you know, I'm, I'm a traditional Republican here. You know, let's ignore Donald Trump. Let's ignore uh, everything that's going on. Let's ignore the tax plan in, in, in one way, which is, which is uniquely unpopular in this district, a district which it should be very popular in considering the wealth. But the loss of the SALT deduction changes that calculation here. And he's got to bring them back and say, whatever you think is going on down in Washington, it would be worse if Democrats were in charge of Congress. Patrick, remind us, what does the polling show in this district for these two candidates? Well, right now, we have a, a four-point lead for, for Mikey Sherrill, but that's what we call a statistically insignificant lead. Uh, yeah, the dynamics of this, of this district, it's, it's a Republican district. It is still a Republican district, and that can help Jay Weber if he can win those, uh, th those folks back, bring them back on the ranch, as it were. Ha yes. Have you seen things change, though, any shifting in the demographics in this, in this district, anything that, that gives uh, uh, one candidate the advantage, one candidate uh, a disadvantage, anything like that? Right. As I said, it's still a Republican district, but not quite as a Republican as it, as it has been because of an increase in enthusiasm, particularly in the Essex County portion of the district, which makes about a quarter of the electorate. A lot of Democrats there, a lot of Democrats unhappy, an increase in registration uh, among these Democrats in, in this district. Those are the things that are helping Mikey Sherrill. Brenda, let me ask you this. All, All right. politics is local, yes. but this year is different, vastly different. To what extent are national issues and particularly President Trump having any impact on this campaign? Listen, I think national politics are affecting this campaign in a big way. And I think uh, to something that Patrick just said, that is the challenge for uh, Assemblyman Weber. He is uh, he has doubled down uh, on his support by President Trump, a president who is not popular uh, within the district. He has doubled down on his support of a tax bill that every North Jersey congressman voted against. Uh, so I would say that national politics play a big part uh, in this race. Uh, you know, as over the next 30 days, and the, and all and the challenge uh, for. Um, Assemblyman Weber is to try to thread this needle, which it looks to me right now he's not doing a very good job of. Monica, your response to that? 
Well, I think that Brendan is in a way living in a bit of a fairy tale. If we look at Patrick <laughs> Murray's poll and the fact that our opponent has spent over $4 million on this race since his first poll was taken last summer and then the poll that came out tonight and there has been zero mo movement, it tells you one thing. It says that the message that the true blue Democrat that Mikey Sherrill is, is not resonating here in con Congressional District 11. What Jay Weber brings to the table, we call them kitchen table issues. They're the issues that matter to people here every day across the aisle. And I'll tell you this, Jay Weber has made it clear he is opposed to the salt cap. But at the end of the day, that tax package, it's going to save people, average families in this district, over $6,000. If you're opposed to the tax package, you're, you're for a $6,000 tax hike. I, oh. I, you know, and before, and we'll let the candidates do the back and forth. Before we go in the, you know, the back and forth, I would just say that this has been traditionally a Republican district. It's been a Republican district uh, for a long time, uh, and the fact that. Um, the fact that we have uh, both uh, some of the public polling people baked in, but they're baked in in a sense of supporting the Democratic candidate shows uh, where the people in this district are. We're going to go to the rules now, and here they are. The candidates here have qualified to be on the official ballot published by the State Division of Elections and have at least 10 percent support among registered voters as reflected by a reputable, experienced and independent poll. Here are the ground rules. The moderator will ask the questions. The editorial content of the questions has been determined by our editorial staff and has not been shared with any candidate. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer. Should the moderator allow follow-ups or rebuttals, responses will be limited to 30 seconds. Each candidate will be allowed to pose one question directly to his or her opponent. While there will be no opening statements, candidates will be allowed 60 seconds for closing statements. And the order of closing statements and podium positions were chosen by a coin toss. With that, we turn it over now to our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron. Michael Hill, Mary Alice, thank you both. Welcome, everybody, to the NJTV News Congressional District 11 debate. Welcome, Mikey Sherrill. Welcome, Jay Weber. We're going to get right to it. We're starting with a question for both of you, starting with Mr. Weber. The nation has just come through an historic and bitter fight over Justice Brett Kavanaugh's suitability for the Supreme Court. We've been listening to a national conversation about it. You're running for a national office. In your opinion, was the Senate right to confirm Justice Kavanaugh? Well, thank you, Michael, for having us. Thank you for uh, NG, NJTV for hosting us this evening. We appreciate the opportunity. Uh, to be speaking with you. I think the whole country was disappointed with the way in which the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing was handled. Uh, certainly these issues that came up at the last minute uh, should have been vetted in the summer and uh, should have been disposed of long before uh, we uh, saw them for the first time in late September. My personal opinion was that uh, Dr. Ford uh, suffered uh, great emotional harm. Uh, I think she was a very empathetic figure. Uh, but she made allegations that could not be corroborated. Those allegations were 36 years old. And at the end of the day, uh, ju Judge, now Justice Kavanaugh, uh, had uh, tremendous support and corroborating evidence for his version of the facts. And so when you have a justice of the Supreme Court uh, ready to be confirmed, uh, my thought was that uncorroborated allegations that were so old just couldn't interfere with the workings of the highest levels of our justice system, and therefore he should have been confirmed. Thank you. Ms. Cheryl? Well, again, thank you, Michael, for having us here tonight. Um, I really appreciate you moderating the debate. Thank you to my husband, Jason, and Maggie and Lincoln for coming out tonight. And Merritt and Ike, if you are awake, go to bed, please. Um, yes, I, I think that's, you know, I think Assemblyman Weber sort of laid out why we're all so disappointed with how this happened. These issues should have been vetted prior to um, the hearings in the Senate because that's not how we want our nation to move forward on making one of the most important decisions the Senate can make for these lifetime appointments to the court. I found uh, Dr. Ford very credible, but again, this all should have taken place before it got to the Senate. I was a federal prosecutor. I don't think, uh, I've not seen an FBI investigation that can only last a week and that comes up with credible information. So I think what needed to happen um, was a longer investigation into just what the facts were, what the truth was. And uh, so at that time, I wouldn't have supported his uh, nomination to the bench. You would not, if you had to vote when the Senate voted, you would not have voted for him. Correct. 
Uh, let me follow and start with you, Ms. Cheryl. Uh, how does the Kavanaugh confirmation change the landscape of this campaign, if at all? Well, you know, I don't think it changes the landscape of this campaign, because what this campaign has always been about um, are the issues that are near and dear to people here in New Jersey. So after over a year of listening to people throughout this district, um, after a year of going to living rooms and kitchen tables, the concerns are the fact that this tax plan is worse for our district than any other state in the nation. Uh, the fact that the constant attacks on our health care resulted in rising premiums. The fact that we can't get our critical infrastructure needs funded to grow our economy now and well into the future. Mr. Weber, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, does it change the contours of the campaign at all, the Kavanaugh fight? Uh, not all that much. I mean, it reinforces the dynamic we've seen in this race, and that is that one side wants to run a culture war based on social issues looking backwards, and that were the opponents of uh, Judge Kavanaugh. And one side's talking about those economic issues, the issues of immigration and affordable health care, focused on people, uh, things that people really care about. And so the, the confirmation hearings, I think, brought that into stark relief, and people are seeing that now, and they're energized to go out there and vote for someone who's going to address those kitchen table issues and not continually try to divide people. Uh, with uh, a constant look back on these social issues. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about an issue that uh, you've both already referred to, the tax cut. Uh, this is for both of you, starting with Mr. Weber. The tax cut that President Trump and Congress passed last year has two effects on New Jerseyans. They save money because of lower tax rates, and some lose money because of the $10,000 cap on state and local deductions otherwise known as SALT. On balance, was it a good or bad deal for the people in your district? On balance, a good deal. Uh, far more people gain than lose under this tax bill. And the uh, average family in this district gets a $6,000 tax cut. $6,000 to their bottom line because of that tax cut. That's the biggest benefit to any district in the state of New Jersey, and it should have been supported. And we're seeing the benefits of this, Michael, play out in the economy record unemployment low, almost 50 years since we've seen 3.7 percent unemployment. We see wages rising. We see small business confidence rising. And all of those things, we see uh, 1.5 million fewer Medicaid recipients since the tax bill was passed. We can talk about all the numbers you want, but the human impact of this uh, tax cut uh, is felt across New Jersey and across this country. People are more secure in their jobs. They want a small business. They have the uh, ability and confidence to go forward in this economy and start a small business. The arrow is pointing up in this country, and it's in large part due to that tax cut. We should be celebrating it, not looking for the dark lining and the silver cloud that America is enjoying. Ms. Cheryl, on balance, uh, good or not good for your, your district? So this tax plan has been bad for New Jersey. In fact, we're the worst affected state in the nation. That's why no member of the North Jersey delegation, including representatives Lance and Freelingheisen, voted in favor of it because they know it's bad for our district. Um, we see that the Chamber of Commerce in New Jersey said it would be bad for our economy. We know that of the four counties in this district, with the state and local tax deduction cap at 10,000, the four counties in the district uh, pay an average of 19,000. And before we get too excited about the economy, I think it's telling. They pay an average of 19,000 in property taxes. In the state and local. And, and they have an average deduct of 19,000 deductions in the state and local property tax, and you can only deduct 10,000. Um, and then we see that the NASDAQ just fell today uh, to the lowest point in seven years. We know that the Dow is the lowest point since February. So I think, um, you know, we need a tax plan that helps all states, not just a chosen few. And this tax plan has been particularly bad for our state. Uh, well, quick thought. I mean, quick, uh, go ahead. You, you, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, it's unbelievable that we have a candidate for Congress cheering for the stock market to go down. I mean, the stock market has been up in the last year and a half since President Trump uh, gained, uh, gained office. And people have prospered because of that. Their 401ks are uh, better. Their 529s are better. I oppose the salt, uh, cap, salt deduction cap. It should be lifted or eliminated. But to uh, suggest that our economy is not roaring, that people aren't more prosperous than they were a year ago, is absolutely absurd. One follow from Ms. Cheryl. Uh, well, Michael, you, if I, I may, yeah, I, I may. would just say I certainly am not cheering uh, for the stocks falling. Um, I'm concerned about uh, this tax plan and how hard it's been on people here in New Jersey. And, uh, 
when you see the uh, economy growing in other parts of the country, that's wonderful. We just don't feel that here in New Jersey. Our families have been suffering, and this tax plan has made it worse. Uh, you say that uh, New Jersey loses more in the salt deduction cap than any state in the nation. Uh, but the number f for the state as a whole is 10.2 percent lose uh, on balance. So that means nearly 90 percent gain. Uh, does that change your position at all? Well, no, it's not just the state and local tax deduction. It's where we see the tax cuts. It's where uh, this tax plan invests in our families. And this one just hasn't helped our families. So as you go around the district and hear from people, you're seeing that the constantly rising cost of living here in New Jersey, um, which has been combined with the fact that since the Great Recession, our state hasn't been able to grow, has made it harder and harder for people to raise their families here. All right, let's move on. Uh, we're going to go over now to John Mooney, the founding editor of NJ Spotlight, who's in our digital newsroom with a viewer question. John? Hi, Michael. Um, as you see behind me, I'm in, in the NJTV newsroom. A lot of action here. Also, a lot of conversation online about these debates. NJ Spotlight and NJTV reached out to our readers and viewers over the last week to get their ideas on some of the questions that should be asked tonight. And a big issue was health care. And one of those we heard from was Dan Johnson of Morristown, 30-year-old, single man, voter in this election, says he's on the fence. A big issue of health care, rising costs, and shrinking coverage. And he talked about a real concern. And his question, he centers around the U.S. Uh, being un unique among in industrial nations for those high costs, all while there's a rise in infant mortality and a drop in, in life expectancy. And also the U.S., one of the few that has a private for-profit insurance model. His question for the candidates, how do you propose fixing this system to bring U.S. health care more in line with the rest of the world? And this goes to Mr. Weber first. There's a few things we can do and we should do uh, immediately, and that is uh, to allow people to buy health insurance across state lines. It would immediately lower uh, health insurance costs for New Jerseyans. It could, they could buy policies that fit their family's needs and their family's budgets. We should aggressively attack chronic illnesses. Uh, treat them and prevent them. 75% of our health care spend in this country can be attributed to chronic illnesses like asthma and diabetes and their later onsets. Uh, we should protect our doctors from jackpot uh, lawsuit verdicts. Tort reform could help doctors uh, order fewer uh, tests and practice less defensive medicine. The one thing we shouldn't do is to do something that Mikey Sherrill is wide open to, and that is a Medicare for All plan that would not only blow up Medicare, but cost our country $32 trillion over the next 10 years. A socialized medicine scheme is not the direction we should go, and that Mikey can't reject that out of hand is a problem for Mikey. Michelle, you have 60 seconds to address John Mooney's question. Certainly, um, I'll address that. Uh, Assemblyman Weber knows, though, that I have rejected out of hand the Medicare for All plan that we've seen that cost $32 trillion. I have said time and again that I'm against raising taxes on the New Jersey taxpayer and that I won't support a plan that's going to do just that. Um, but the fact of the matter is we do need to improve our health care and we do need to get costs down. And what's striking about some of the proposals that Assemblyman Weber has talked about, uh, including the preventative measures that are included in the Affordable Care Act, is that they are included in the Affordable Care Act. There is prevention included in that act. And so if we had bipartisan reform, if we had both sides working together to get better health care for this nation, um, I think we could really do that. We could look at things like allowing people 55 and older to buy into Medicare. We could look at things like having uh, Medicare and Medicaid negotiate for drug prices to bring drug costs down. Um, and yet when we constantly fight, and as we've seen the Republicans put forth 70 repeal bills with no replacement uh, included in those repeal bills, uh, that's not the type of new leadership and bipartisanship we need to see in Congress. Let's ask Mr. Weber what you think of uh, extending Medicare down to the age of 55 that Ms. Cheryl just proposed. I'd be very reluctant to do that, Michael. We have a problem with Medicare in that we're worried about funding the program's obligations as it stands today. And so expanding it uh, does not sound like a solution to the problem. It sounds like uh, making the problem bigger. We have to protect Medicare for the people who are relying on it, not expand a program, blow it up. And, uh, you know, if, you, if, if it becomes too large, it's, it's not going to serve the population that it's intended to serve. And what do you think of his proposal to allow insurance companies to uh, sell policies across state lines and uh, 
the promotion of tort reform for medical malpractice insurance. So we can look at selling insurance policies across state lines. In fact, that's critical to some of our states in the nation, um, especially for competition and to get costs down. But we need to do that with uh, federally, because right now, for example, the insurance markets in New Jersey cover certain people that bring costs down that say the insurance markets in Pennsylvania don't. So by going across state lines, we would have a different risk pool, and that could actually bring costs up because we would be insuring um, seniors and older people and not get the younger people in like Pennsylvania's insurance pool. So that's why we need federal regulation and bipartisan discussions on how to move forward. M Mr. Weber, uh Ms. Sherrill, in her campaign literature, says that you would strip coverage of uh, pre-existing conditions. What's your view on that? It's simply not true, and it's entirely baseless. It's, it's not, uh, not the first time that Sherrill campaign has uh, blatantly lied about uh, my positions. We can do all of the reforms that I was talking about and provide uh, protections for people with pre-existing conditions. We have to. It's a major concern when people put their head on the pillow at night. Uh, are they going to lose their health insurance? Do they have uh, conditions that are going to prevent them from getting the care they need? Uh, I would absolutely support uh, keeping and uh, expanding protections for people with pre-existing conditions. So, Ms. Cheryl, do you, want to, you have 30 seconds. Do you want to withdraw the charge that he would... Well, I'm glad to hear he wants to keep the pre-existing conditions. Uh, that was part of the Affordable Care Act and something that I think many people throughout the district want to keep. Originally, he in the past wanted to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which would have stripped coverage from people with pre-existing conditions. All right. Uh, let's move on. Uh, this question goes to Ms. Sherrill. Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid consume 49% of the federal budget. All are under strain to stay solvent. How will you ensure their solvency? I think that's a great question and something that I think a lot of us have been very concerned about. Because after this recent tax plan, which was paid for, by the way, on the backs of the New Jersey taxpayer with the state and local tax deduction and by exploding deficit, our deficit, um, Speaker Paul Ryan said now he, he was going to make cuts to Social Security and Medicare. And that's something that I um, am adamantly opposed to. I don't believe in any cuts. I don't believe in privatizing it. Um, as far as how we want to move forward with that, it is solvent now. We want to make sure it's solvent into the future. This is something that people have paid into for their entire career. And when we look at the history of it, we know that before 1935, before we had Social Security, uh, over half of the seniors were living below the poverty line. So it's a safety net that we have to keep, and we have to look at tax reform that's going to make sure it's solvent well into the future, not a tax reform that simply blows up the deficit and then decides to make cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Mr. Weber, you get a 30-second rebuttal. There's a big subject to cover in 30 seconds, Michael. Mm -hmm. We'll try. Mikey either doesn't understand the program or continually uh, talks out of both sides of her mouth, because you can't be both for Obamacare and say, I don't want to cut Medicare. Obama took, Obamacare took $800 billion dollars out of Medicare to fund its subsidies. You can't say you're going to protect Medicare and then say, I like Obamacare. We need to protect Social Security. We need to protect Medicare for the people who are relying on it. We need to reform Medicaid to get people off of government assistance and into the private sector. That's what the tax cut did earlier this year. It reduced Medicaid rolls by $1.5 million. That's a good thing we should be celebrating, not something we should be wringing our hands over. Another entitlements question, this one to Mr. Weber. The population is aging. That puts a strain on Social Security. Some have proposed gradually raising the retirement age by one month per year. Chris Christie made that a centerpiece of his campaign for a presidential nomination. Would you support slowly raising the retirement age? Michael, I support balancing the federal budget. And we have to do that in a context of a growing economy and common sense tax policy. A growing economy will help protect our Social Security recipients. A growing economy will help protect our Medicare recipients. Uh, any reforms that we might consider uh, to our entitlements have to be done in a context of, of an economy that can afford it and sustain it. And so that's my goal when I go down to Washington, not to cut Social Security, but rather to grow our economy so that we can sustain the programs that people have been counting on. So you would not raise the retirement age one, slowly, one no. month a year? No. Ms. Cheryl, you have 30 seconds to re for a uh, rebuttal. No, I would not uh, raise the retirement age slowly. 
And uh, speaking of not understanding a system, I think it's striking that Assemblyman Weber says he's not for deficits and yet um, is for this tax plan that just has increased our deficit exponentially. And, and now, and pretty soon, we will be paying more in interest on this deficit um, than we will be paying for defense spending. Uh, I would like to go back to that uh, and ask you, Mr. Weber, uh, the Congressional Budget Office says that under this current tax plan, our $21 trillion debt will balloon to $33 trillion in 10 years. Is that acceptable? Uh, I don't think it's accurate. Uh, the CBO had estimates when the tax package was passed. The federal government has exceeded revenue expectations every month since the tax package went into effect. We are seeing a windfall of revenues that, are, that is drastically reducing and changing the assumptions that the CBO made. Not only that, we're spending less because fewer people are receiving Medicaid, fewer people are receiving food stamps because our economy is growing. Is the debt a problem? Absolutely it is. Should we eliminate the deficit? We should. But doing it in the context of a robust economy and a growing economy that provides opportunity for all Americans, that's the right time to have the discussion. Not going back to the Obama era ways of spending ourselves in the deficits and having a stagnant economy. Do you want to rebuttal? So, uh... As people recall, when President Obama came into office, uh, we were facing a recession, and luckily it didn't turn into a depression. And that's the time you sometimes spend in an economy to ensure that it doesn't get worse. Of course, now, um, when we do have a growing and robust economy, is generally not the time that you explode your deficit. So I was opposed to uh, this huge expansion of our deficit, and I, I don't think it's going to, be, going to be good for our economy, and it's certainly not fair to place that on the backs of our children. All right, we're going to move on to student debt. Uh, the question uh, comes from our business con correspondent, Rhonda Schaffler, who prepared this background report on the issue. Student loan debt has reached $1.5 trillion, according to the U.S. Federal Reserve. Total outstanding student debt has doubled in less than 10 years. That's the highest category of consumer debt after mortgages. In New Jersey, the average student graduates with more than $32,000 in debt, the sixth highest debt level among the 50 states. And all that debt poses a risk to the economy, according to the head of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell. And as student loan continues to grow and becomes larger and larger, then it absolutely could hold back growth. Some students simply cannot make their payments, and default rates on student debt are much higher than default rates on other types of consumer debt. According to the Department of Education's most recently available data, the current student loan default rate is 10.8 percent. New Jersey's default rate is lower at 9.7 percent. But critics point out the department only looks at defaults in a three-year period and doesn't fully capture the financial distress. In fact, the Federal Reserve states delinquency rates could be twice as high. We have a question now for both candidates, starting with Ms. Cheryl. What can be done to stop this trend of rising student loan debt? Uh, this trend is really harming a lot of our young people. It's making them unable to purchase houses, uh, making them unable to get married and start a family of their own because of this huge burden of debt that they have. In fact, uh, someone on my staff has an interest rate of 7 percent for uh, her debt, her college debt. So we should allow uh, students to negotiate uh, with the banks to, to bring their debt down um, as far as the interest rates, like you do for a home loan. We also need to look at how we're spending money. The United States spends a lot of money on our colleges and universities, and some of that goes uh, to uh, the GI Bill, where our veterans many times go to for-profit schools. In fact, if you go outside many of our bases, you'll see a lot of for-profit colleges who, uh, and they know that they can uh, have predatory loans, quite frankly, on our soldiers and sailors, um, and then they never get a degree, and they owe this huge amount of debt. Um, we also have seen uh, that sometimes we're not moving students into the correct fields. So sometimes a two-year college degree will help our students get into jobs in the near term, whereas sometimes these four-year degrees don't get them work, and they owe a huge amount of debt. Mr. Weber, your thoughts on student loan debt? Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on them. i got seven kids going to college someday soon, so I'm, I'm concerned about it. Uh, I think there's three things that we can do primarily. Uh, look at this. First of all, we've got to hold our colleges and universities accountable. Uh, we, we see in Indiana, Purdue University holding its tuition flat for four years in a row. Rutgers should be required to do the same thing. Uh, second, uh, 
we should try different ways to finance our college educations. I've been a leader in the state assembly talking about innovative ways to provide college education and finance college education for our students. Why don't we allow students to sell equity in their future careers instead of always taking on debt? In other words, have a lender pay for their college education and then have the students pay back a percentage of their income as uh, they go through their careers. But finally, Michael, the best way to uh, lower student debt is to have those 529s explode. A growing economy addresses so many of the problems that we have in this country. Not only would people borrow less if their 529s were larger, but they'd be able to find high paying jobs when they got out of school. That's what we're seeing in America now. That's what we need to continue to encourage. Ms. Cheryl, a quick uh, follow. Uh, some are proposing, including Governor Murphy, free community college as a way to attack this problem. Do you support that? You know, I've been talking a lot about how uh, the tax burden on our New Jersey families is making it really hard to afford the cost of living. And so without understanding how that would be paid for, I haven't supported it because it sounds like it would raise taxes on our families. Um, right now in my own town, uh, we see a lot of families that are just saying, you know, I, I can't afford to live here. I, I might have to move out of state because I can't raise my family here. And that's unacceptable. Um, so, no, I haven't been supporting that at this time. You want a rebuttal? 30 seconds? It's, a, it's an area of agreement. I don't support it either. I hope that Mikey lobbied Governor Murphy when he uh, came to support her, uh, to tell him he's going the wrong way, like he went the wrong way on taxes, like he's going the wrong way on immigration. Uh, I would love to hear Mikey Sherrill speak up more to challenge the leadership in her party. All right, let's move on. We asked both of you to pose a question to the other. It's time for that, starting with Mr. Weber. Okay. Uh, Mikey, you've campaigned a lot on demanding new leadership in Washington, yet you have as a running mate uh, corrupt Senator Bob Menendez, and you haven't said a word about his all-too-long tenure in Washington. Uh, you've campaigned a lot on bipartisanship and asking for more bipartisan leadership in Washington, yet a bipartisan panel of the United States Senate has censured Senator Menendez, said he took gifts illegally and should pay them back. You haven't said a word about that issue either. Uh, you tout yourself as a former federal prosecutor, but when federal prosecutors found corroborating evidence of Senator Bob Menendez trafficking in underage prostitutes, you've said nothing about that. And so my question to you this evening is, straight and very simple, yes or no, will you be voting for Bob Menendez for U.S. Senator this year? Well, thank you for that question. I, I have been talking about this because, to be clear, um, ethics are very important to me. It was a huge part of the curriculum at the Naval Academy. Um, a large part of my naval service and my service at the federal prosecutor's office. And so I agree with the Senate Ethics Committee. Senator Menendez needs to pay back that loan. And now our choice is between someone who has been a fighter for New Jersey and somebody who's quite frankly made his millions by raising drug prices on cancer patients. So I'm going to go with a fighter for New Jersey because too much is at stake. We need a tax plan that invests in our middle class families. We need quality and affordable health care uh, for everybody across this country. We have got to get our infrastructure needs funded because our economy cannot move forward without funding the Gateway Tunnel. Do you want a 30-second rebuttal? I think that's the problem with Mikey Sherrill. She will associate with anybody to get to the House of Representatives. And if you are associating yourself with Senator Bob Menendez to get to the House of Representatives, there's something very wrong about your campaign. Do you want a quick comment in I reply? I would just say that this is about the 11th District of New Jersey. I know Assemblyman Weber would like to talk about anything but the issues here and the real issues at stake for the 11th District because he uh, doesn't share the concerns of many people here or the values of most people here. But I can tell you who I associate with. It's generally Navy veterans, former federal prosecutors, uh, the police who've endorsed me, the firefighters who endorse me, and I'll continue to associate with them uh, as I move forward. Now it's your turn to ask Mr. Weber a question. So, Assemblyman Weber, um, you were part of a group uh, in Harvard Law School that um, was, uh, you didn't believe that being gay was a choice. And you felt that through prayer, um, people could stop being gay. And then you worked very hard for an amendment to our Constitution on several occasions to ban gay marriage. And you refused to vote against conversion therapy for our LGBT youth, despite knowing uh, that it leads to suicides and depressions and drug use. So as a mom, that was very concerning to me. And I just wondered if you could explain your position on conversion therapy for us tonight. Sure. Uh, Michael, Mikey gets her facts wrong all the time, and, and she's uh, wrong again. My, you know who else is part of that group? Mikey's my wife, Johanna, who's here with me. 
uh, a group that defended people's uh, religious liberties, and uh, uh, something that I'm very proud of. And of course, I know you, Mikey, support the First Amendment, of course. Michael, in this country, people have the right to be who they want to be, and they have the right to live the way they want to live. Mikey keeps looking backwards six years to a bill that even the Star Ledger, no conservative rag, uh, said should not be voted on, should not, should not be approved, because uh, the relationship and the communication between licensed therapists and patients uh, should be sacrosanct. And the government, no matter what you think about the form of the therapy, the government shouldn't be interfering uh, with the, uh, the communications between patients and their therapists. And so, uh, of course, I don't agree with anything that would harm, harm or um, cause uh, trouble for uh, our youth, but um, to interfere with the relationship between uh, therapists and, and their patients, well, that's something the Star-Ledger said we shouldn't do, and that's something I didn't think we should do. You got a 30-second rebuttal. So knowing that conversion therapy has been debunked and that it's so harmful to our young people, um, are you opposed to conversion therapy? I'm opposed to interfering with communication between therapists and their patients. If a licensed therapist wants to provide uh, something and a parent or a family wants to accept that therapy, it's not for the government to say uh, that they, what they can and can't say. This is the perfect example, Michael, of Mikey Sherrill looking back, trying to dredge up old social issues to divide people. When I'm talking about kitchen table issues like the economy and taxes and immigration and the things that really impact uh, the, the lives of the people of North Jersey, not issues that were settled six years ago uh, and, and don't, don't exist in the state of New Jersey. All right, well, I'm going to give her another 30 seconds uh, just because you sort of accused her of looking backwards. Uh, how do you respond? Um, I did not hear a no, I don't support conversion therapy, which has been debunked as is and is dangerous for our kids. So I'm concerned. All right, all right. Uh, it's time for another viewer question. Uh, given to us by John Mooney of NJ Spotlight. John? Hi, hi Michael. Um, there's been a lot of uh, interesting questions and conversations online, and, and our readers and viewers are really uh, um, posing some really insightful things. A big topic is climate change, especially in light of the recent uh, international report predicting some catastrophic uh, impact in the coming decades. One of our readers is uh, Sally Malanga of uh, West Orange, and she's a voter also in this district of a businesswoman or owner of a business who was really concerned about coming scarcity of agricultural and food products that she relies upon. Uh, she says candidates aren't talking about climate change despite its urgency. And her question tonight is, would the candidates immediately support a carbon tax and dividend on fossil fuels? It's a prominent proposal that has recently gained bipartisan support. And if not, why? All right, uh, you each get 60 seconds for this question, starting with Assemblyman Mr. Weber. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, when we talk about the environment and the protection of the environment and what we leave to our children, uh, it is an obligation that everyone that goes to Washington needs to take seriously. And of course I will. And I have. Serving in the State Assembly, I have been able to balance uh, the needs of our environment uh, with the uh, opportunity we have to have for a growing and thriving economy that will support uh, our population. I've done things like vote against drilling off our coast to stop pipelines coming in uh, to New Jersey so that we don't have end runs around those uh, drilling pipelines, and to support cost-efficient things like wind energy uh, when they make sense. Uh, if someone shows me uh, a plan that will address climate change that is fair to the American taxpayer, uh, that treats all nations uh, equally, and that puts everyone with skin in the game, I will consider that. So far, we haven't seen it. And I'd be very reluctant to tie America's hands behind its back when China and India and others won't do the same. Ms. Cheryl, 60 seconds. So I'm very proud of New Jersey um, because, as you've heard from Assemblyman Weber and you'll hear from me, um, there's broad agreement uh, that climate change is real and that it needs to be addressed. Um, we even saw Governor Christine Todd Whitman break with the party in Washington uh, because she doesn't think that they are supporting um, the needs of the environment uh, as well as they should be. And so here in New Jersey, we know uh, the needs for real uh, investment in protecting New Jersey and moving forward in a way that is going to be less harmful for our environment. Uh, we have opportunities, though, and that's the good news. We have the best offshore wind conditions in the world. 
here. So we should be looking at new technologies in wind and leading the way because the cost of wind power technology is going down every single year. Uh, we have over 600 jobs in solar in the 11th district alone. We need to build upon that. Those are also, by the way, great jobs for vets. So I'm very invested in that. Um, we have so many economic opportunities, so moving forward on a green power economy is not just helpful for our environment here in New Jersey, but helpful for our economy. So the question asked uh, uh, directly, would you support a carbon tax? Uh, Mr. Weber implied he would not because it would choke the economy. How about you? I would want to look at that more carefully um, and see uh, if that's the way we want to move forward here. My focus has been on uh, ways we can move forward in our economy here in New Jersey towards a green economy. All right. Let's uh, talk about the Gateway Tunnel Project. Uh, we're, our senior correspondent, Brenda Flanagan, explains what's at stake here. About 450 trains per day, 200,000 passenger trips take the current two-track tunnel under the Hudson. A battering from Superstorm Sandy only up the ante, pushing the crumbling tunnel into critical condition. Service often stops for emergency repairs. You have an aging tunnel, 100 years plus, so it isn't getting better, it isn't healing itself. If even one track fails, forcing all traffic to use the single remaining rail, the number of trains per hour through that tunnel drops from 24 to 6. The $13 billion gateway tunnel project would replace the old structure, and it originally received promises of 50 percent federal funding from the Obama administration. But Donald Trump, after an apparent political feud with New York Senator Chuck Schumer, threatened to block all gateway funding. I do not understand why anybody, for political reasons, would want to do a serious self-inflicted wound. The Port Authority agreed with New York and New Jersey to earmark $5.5 billion for the tunnel. It's repetitioned the federal government to upgrade the project's funding priority. Okay, uh, this question goes to Mr. Weber. You've said on Gateway, quote, no candidate in this field will be better positioned to negotiate with the Trump administration to get this done than I. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is a couple things, Michael. First of all, I started my family in Chatham. Uh, my wife took that train uh, into the city every day, sometimes pregnant, uh, with our oldest daughter, Annie. I know what it is to have that commute, and I've watched that commute, and it's a high priority. So I'm going to prioritize it. We have to build that gateway tunnel. It, it's quite obvious that uh, someone in the minority uh, in Washington from the minority party, a Democrat opposite uh, President Trump's party, will not have the ability to walk in uh, to the White House and say, this is a project that's important to my district, Mr. President. We need to fund it. I will be a leader in Washington to pull together the Port Authority, New York, New Jersey, the White House, and the private sector, if we have to, to make sure that tunnel gets built. Ms. Cheryl, a 30-second rebuttal. Well, might I express some empathy for your wife, because I have done that commute pregnant, and it is no fun. Um, but I will tell you, it's getting less fun, because my husband still does it. And we see derailments, we see uh, train cancellations, uh, we know that they're switching problems. We have got to get the critical infrastructure funding. And quite frankly, if we couldn't see that uh, with the chairman of appropriations, Representative Freelingheisen, in our delegation, then I think what we need to do is have new leadership in Congress uh, and new leaders who can fight hard um, to get that funded. Let me follow up on that. Uh, Rodney Freelingheisen, who sits in the 11th Congressional District seat, as we speak, is the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, if he can't get it done, how can you? Uh, listen, I'm going to talk to the president, and I'm going to ask him to get this done for our district. It's important. It needs to get done. It's a regional priority. Uh, and he's already expressed his support for my candidacy, wants to work with me. And I will take that, go to the White House and say, if you want to work with us, Mr. President, you have to treat New Jersey well. This is a top priority for our district. Ms. Cheryl, you've uh, said that you want to practice bipartisanship and reach across the aisle when possible to solve problems. Would you reach across the aisle and support funding for a border wall if it meant getting the funding for Gateway? Wow. Uh, since Gateway Tunnel is my most important, uh, one of the most important issues in this campaign, um, I would have to look at that decision and that deal. I think the problem, though, is that even the southern state uh, and border states have said that the, the uh, border wall won't be helpful. 
that won't stop the problem of illegal immigration. Um, we need more drones on the border. Um, we do need more funder, funding for security. Uh, but the wall is actually a huge waste of money. Uh, so looking at how we could get the Gateway Tunnel funded is critical, and I would look at uh, the possibilities that come here. But uh, people in the district tell me all the time, they say, you know what, Mikey, we don't need a wall between the United States and Mexico. We need a tunnel into Manhattan. And that's where I think the focus in Washington should be. What's your position on the border wall? Uh, we should secure that border first and foremost. With a wall? Whether it's with physical security, with additional troops, with drones, with electronic uh, means. The people of this country have lost confidence in the federal government to control its borders. And securing the border first is a prerequisite, I think, to any common sense immigration reform. Once we do that, then we can get to these thorny issues about uh, fixing it for the dreamers or uh, reducing luck and, and uh, prioritizing merit for people who come in. This is a big difference between me and Mikey Sherrill on this. I've been very clear about my positions on immigration. Mikey's run with people who want sanctuary cities and sanctuary states, like Phil Murphy, like Nancy Pelosi. Mikey runs with people who want open borders and wants to abolish ICE. Doesn't say anything about the issue unless she's pressed to, uh, in, in a debate forum like this. And so uh, I'm very clear about prioritizing border security, reforming our immigration system, and restoring that important sense of American citizenship that means so much it should be a beacon to the world of freedom instead of being devalued and debased by the people that Mikey Shell runs around with. Let's talk about ICE, uh, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Unit of the federal government. Ms. Sherrill, you spoke at an immigration rally in Morristown this spring, at which, according to your account, several people held signs saying, abolish ICE. Your opponent says you organized a rally, one of whose goals was to abolish ICE. What is your position on abolishing ICE? Well, I don't. Uh, want to abolish ICE. I've never wanted to abolish ICE. Um, I attended a rally that was uh, to discuss border separations, and some people showed up with some signs. Um, and then when Assemblyman Weber uh, tried to deceive the voters in the district and say that I supported abolishing ICE, he was called a flat-out liar by the Star-Ledger, because it's simply not true. There's no evidence I've ever said that I've never said that. Um, if you, as I've said, want to know the people that I run with, uh, you know, they are federal agents. Um, they are federal prosecutors. They are Navy veterans. And if we want to talk about people that you run with, we could talk about people uh, that Assemblyman Weber runs with, who um, were architects of the SALT uh, cap, people who want to take away our health insurance, people who um, don't want to fund the, uh, the tunnel that we need, the gateway tunnel. But I don't generally talk about that because I'm focused on the issues of New Jersey and I'm focused on the 11th District of New Jersey. Mr. Weber, do you still say that she organized a rally calling for the abolition of ICE? Mikey promoted a rally at which somebody spoke and said, we should abolish ICE and we should have open borders. I called on Mikey three times to denounce those comments, uh, to make clear her position, and she stayed silent. The that's, reasonable that's inference, not true. it is true, the, the, the reasonable <laughs> inference was she agreed with everything that was said at the rally. Not until, Michael, the press conference that you covered, where I was going to criticize her very publicly, the hour before that, she issued a press statement saying, I actually don't support the abolishment of ICE because I put my finger in the wind, the wind now and I realized that's a really bad political position for me. That, that's, that's the truth of it. And if, if she says now she doesn't uh, support the abolishment of ICE, she's certainly running with people who do uh, all the time at rallies or people who support sanctuary cities like Phil Murphy. You want to respond? I do. Um, I think time and again, Assemblyman Weber has attempted to deceive the voters here in New Jersey. He uh, has said numerous times that I support Nancy Pelosi. I don't support Nancy Pelosi. I put out a commercial saying that I don't support Nancy Pelosi. Uh, he said that I support abolishing ICE, which I have never said, and then, as I mentioned, was called a flat-out liar by the Star-Ledger. Uh, he said that I want to cut Social Security and Medicaid. I have never once said that I want to cut Social Security and Medicaid. I think what we need to focus on are the real issues of this district. And unfortunately, Assemblyman Weber doesn't share the values of the district, and he's not concerned about the issues of this district. We may get to that. Uh, Ms. Sherrill, your bio says that during your military service, you worked on Russia policy and relations between the U.S. and Russian navies. Do you agree with President Trump that good relations with Russia are preferable to treating it like an enemy? 
I certainly think good relations with Russia um, are preferable. But right now, we don't have a good relationship with Russia. They tried to hack into the heart of our democracy in our election system. Um, they are trying to take advantage of, of us. Uh, they are not promoting our uh, agenda in Syria, certainly, and they have not been a good partner to us in any sense of the word. So why we are now treating our enemies better than our traditional allies is beyond me. Um, we need to have stronger relationships with NATO. Uh, we need to have stronger relationships with the people that support our agenda across this world. And Russia is not one of those states. Mr. Weber, a 30-second rebuttal. We need to be very clear about who our rivals are in this world and who our friends are. Russia is a rival and needs to be treated as such. We'd prefer to be friends, uh, but we have to deal with them with strength. North Korea is a rival. We need to deal with them with strength. We'd prefer peace. We're working towards peace, but uh, we need to deal with them as a rival. When we have friends like Israel, uh, we need to support Israel. And I think the Trump administration has done a wonderful job moving the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem standing up to the Syrians, tearing up the Iranian deal. These are things that we have to do to show our friends that we are their friends and our rivals that we mean business. Let's stay on foreign policy and ask you each, starting with Mr. Weber, uh, which country represents the greatest threat to the United States? Uh, I think increasingly it's China. Uh, North Korea, of course, is, a, is totally unpredictable and has nuclear weapons. That's a problem. Uh, but China is an emerging world power that is seeking uh, military expansion in the South China Sea. Uh, but even more uh, problematic, an economic uh, rise or dominance that uh, threatens our economy. And so uh, I think the president is right to deal with China in a very uh, firm and confrontational way. Again, we should and could have uh, excellent relations with a trading partner that, ha that has so much promise uh, for both countries. But um, uh, an increasingly expansionist uh, China, uh, and a China that's increasingly interested in espionage, uh, stealing our technology, uh, uh, unfair trade deals. Uh, that's a country that we have to, uh, I think, focus on, even as we keep our eye on uh, the Middle East and Iran and terrorist organizations, uh, certainly Russia with all its nuclear weapons. I think China might be first among equals in terms of rivals around the world. Ms. Cheryl, your thought on the country that poses the greatest threat to the country, our country? Well, it's hard to pick just one right now. Um, we have seen some of the uh, national security issues that are, are more dangerous than really any time in the last several decades. Uh, we have an increasingly expansionist Russia. We've seen what they're doing in Syria, the threats they're making there. Um, we see the increasing threat of Iran in the Middle East as well, not just uh, you know, in Syria, but incursions into the Gaza Strip. We've seen them in Qatar and in Yemen. Uh, we do see China. Um, they have long um, been committing espionage against the United States, but their their cyber espionage is growing in, uh, you know, they're, they're getting better and better at it. Uh, certainly, the cyber espionage of Russia has been proven to be very dangerous, and we've seen that in our own elections. So that's why I think it's so important uh, that we look to having a fully staffed State Department, that we look to our, our traditional allies, uh, the NATO countries and Israel, to help us promote our goals across the world and our safety across the world. So you don't want to pick one country? I, I can't pick one. All right. Uh, staying in the same uh, area, uh, this question is for both of you, starting with Mr. Weber. Uh, under President Trump, military spending has increased significantly to almost $700 billion for fiscal year 2019. Are we spending too much on the military, or has Trump found the right balance? I think he's made great strides, Michael, uh, giving our soldiers and sailors a much-needed raise for the first time in years, uh, rewarding their heroism and effort. Uh, I applaud that. Uh, we have to have a strong military. Mikey referenced, we have a lot of rivals and a lot of interests around the world. Uh, not only do we need diplomacy, but we need uh, military strength to uh, back up our diplomacy. And uh, as a world power, as a leading uh, world power, uh, we have to be able to project our influence uh, to every corner of the globe. And so uh, whether it's uh, by uh, land or air or uh, increasingly space, uh, the U.S. has an obligation to maintain a strong military within a balanced budget that um, protects our interests and, and promotes peace and democracy across the world. Ms. Cheryl, do we have the right balance? Um, 
I, I'm not concerned as much about the spending as where the money is being spent. Right now, uh, we have underspent in cybersecurity for several years now. We need to move forward in cybersecurity, which is one of the goals of the Defense Department. Um, I think we also uh, have looked at some of um, the rotations of our personnel on ships, and uh, we're looking at the different rotations and how we could do that better. I'm happy to see that some of the deployments had gone on for far too long for especially our sailors. Um, and we need to put uh, that money into R&D. We need to uh, keep, make sure that we are always at the cutting edge, especially when we see more and more money going into uh, the Russian military, the Chinese military. So we need to put money into R&D, which isn't just for our defense, but also helps us develop the new technologies of tomorrow, including, uh, as Assemblyman Weber, in, in some of our, our, the areas of space, uh, when we're moving into satellite technology and some of that rocket technology. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, this question is for both of you, starting with Mr. Weber. We have a national problem around race. In the area of policing alone, we see striking imbalances in terms of marijuana arrests, traffic stops, incarcerations, and police shootings. What are some of the reasons for this, and what do you propose to do legislatively to address it? Well, Michael, I'm no sociologist to tell you uh, what underlies all those statistics. Here's what I know. In this country, the color of your skin shouldn't matter. And we need to have a government and policies that encourage us to be race blind, treat everybody equally, uh, instead of constantly dividing people on the basis of their race or their ethnicity. The, uh, the best thing I think we can do and the best social program we have in America is a job. And so when we see record low African-American unemployment, record low Hispanic unemployment, due to the leadership of this president, due to the leadership of Congress and cutting taxes, that helps a lot of problems in this country, Michael. It, it, it solves a lot of social ills, and that's what our goal should be, a race-blind society that's prosperous and provides opportunity for all. Let me quickly follow up. Uh, you, you've accused uh, Ms. Cheryl in the past of engaging in identity politics, and I think you just alluded to it without out and out saying it. What does that mean, identity politics? It, it means talking to people as if uh, their interests are based on their ethnicity. Uh, Mikey did a press conference in Morristown talking about Hispanic-owned businesses and criticized me for voting against set-asides for Hispanic-owned businesses. Well, what about Indian-owned businesses? What about Chinese-owned businesses? They're important, too, and I don't see why we should... You against those, too. <laughs> I, I, I vote against all set-asides because everybody should be treated equally. Everybody should be treated equally. And if you want to divide this country based on ethnicity and then play, up, play it up in a campaign, I think that demeans our politics and separates our society. I'm interested in uniting us, Michael, not dividing us. And let, Michael's running a divisive campaign. Let me get uh, your response to that and then your thought on the racial issues. Certainly. I, I wish uh, we lived in a post-racial society, but we don't. Um, I wish we lived in a society that valued women as much as men uh, in the workplace, but we don't. Women only make 82 cents on every dollar. That's why I was proud to see the assembly uh, and the Senate recently passed, and Governor Murphy signed into law an equal pay bill, which uh, Assemblyman Weber was one of only two people in the entire legislature to vote against. Um, these are real concerns and real issues, and how we handle them um, is, you know, is complex because some of the, the ways we've handled it in the past have not led to the kind of prosperity that we want it to lead to. But um, as far as uh, looking at uh, how we move forward, the problems between uh, the over-incarceration of black and brown men, um, the problems of the, uh, you know, how uh, people are treated with marijuana crimes, cocaine versus crack cocaine. We need comprehensible criminal justice reform. And it's part of the reason I'm running. Part of the reason that I feel so deeply that the legislative branch of our government is not functioning in the way we need it to function. Um, the Koch brothers and the ACLU agree on the criminal justice bill that we have to get through Congress. It has wide bipartisan support, and yet it hasn't passed. We have got to start to address these real concerns. We have to look at the federal sentencing guidelines, which, as I alluded to, have disparities between crack and powder cocaine. Um, we need to uh, look at how um, we are treating uh, people in prison. We need to look at here in New Jersey. We actually have some very good progressive criminal justice legislation on the books, and yet uh, the disparities between uh, black and brown men and white men in our prisons are, are some of the highest in the nation. Um, these are all the things that we have to take a look at. Got to stop you there, but you raised the equal pay issue, and I want to pursue that. 
Mr. Weber, uh, in April, the Assembly passed an equal pay for equal work bill. You were one of only two no votes. The vote was 74 to 2. Your opponent has seized on that as suggesting that you are anti-woman. Why did you oppose that measure? Well, Michael, it wasn't an equal pay for equal work bill. I wish you would have uh, characterized it better because I think you understand the law better. We had equal pay for equal work in the state, and we've had it for decades. The bill that we voted on was redundant and, frankly, uh, is something that the New Jersey Law Journal said was a bad bill. Um, I'm committed to equal pay for equal work. It's what I do for a living, defend women in the workplace when they're discriminated against uh, in matters of pay or sexually harassed or, or, or other things. Uh, here's the problem. Mikey Sherrill knows this. You're an attorney, Mikey, and you know that equal pay for equal work was the law of the land before we ever voted on this bill. The bill will crush small employers with uh, punitive damages going back six years in their statute of limitations. It is bad for business. It is wrong for New Jersey. We should have what we had before April, which was equal pay for equal work, the same position that Bar Barack Obama took and that I supported. The New Jersey Law Journal editorialized against the equal pay bill, saying it was harmful to business, as Mr. Weber says. Uh, what do you think of his argument uh, that we already had a, an equal pay law? We didn't need a new one. Uh, well, 74 members of the Senate and Assembly thought we did because they know, like I know, that women are only making 82 cents for every dollar here in New Jersey. And that's not good for business when people are treated unequally. Um, we do need better legislation on this. And not only does, uh, you know, as far as not, I do claim that Assemblyman Weber does not support women um, because not only does he not support equal pay, he doesn't support Planned Parenthood. He was one of the people under Chris Christie uh, that made us the first state in the nation to defund Planned Parenthood. And when that happened, we saw the rates of breast cancer screenings go down. Uh, we saw the rates of STDs go up. These are the things that uh, aren't the values of this district and aren't the values that we here in this district share. Uh, interesting that you should bring up values because that's our next question. But a quick response on uh, the uh, anti choice position that... Uh, just the presumptuousness of Mikey to think that she, she presumes to speak for all women in this district. Uh, my wife told me before I went to go vote on that uh, bill in April, she said, you better vote against that because it's the right thing to do. Don't get cowed by political pressure. Don't get blown with the wind. Don't go with the crowd. Do the right thing. Uh, and, and to suggest that uh, a father of four beautiful daughters and the husband of a Harvard Law trained wife is somehow anti-woman is frankly, offensive. All right, let's leave that there and go to uh, uh, this question for Mr. Weber. Your campaign has said, quote, Mikey Sherrill is wildly out of touch with North Jersey values. What are North Jersey values? North Jersey values are fiscally conservative. North Jersey values want our laws enforced at the border and want a fair deal for the kids who are here illegally through no fault of their own. New Jersey values reject senators like Bob Menendez, who were caught taking a million dollars in illegal gifts. They don't vote for them, Mikey. Uh, New Jersey values are not supporting Nan Nancy Pelosi. And Mikey might say and might spend a lot of money saying I'm not going to vote for her for speaker. Michael, you've seen the quote. Mikey Sherrill thinks that Nancy Pelosi was the most effector, effective speaker that we've seen in the last several decades. And she applauds the le legislation she was able to pass. I don't care if your name is Nancy Pelosi or Joe Smith. If that's the kind of speaker you want in Washington, you don't represent North Jersey values. You've called him representative of Arkansas values because Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas has been here once or twice on his behalf. And you've called her... Uh, uh, Montclair Mikey. You've called her Montclair Mikey, and you've also said she personifies San Francisco values because... She said nice things about Nancy Pelosi. Uh, you want to repeat those allegations or withdraw them tonight? Arkansas, Arkansas values over here? So as a person from a state that only gets 74 cents back on every dollar, and as a person from a state that was worse hit by this tax bill than any state in the nation, um, I'm not surprised that Senator Cotton endorsed Assemblyman Weber because he supports uh, things that are probably really good for the state of Arkansas. They're just really bad for New Jersey. Uh, and I would say it seems like 
uh, from hearing Assemblyman Weber tell it, New Jersey values involve deceiving the voters. Because I've already expressed uh, this litany of charges that he levies against me that have uh, he's been called out on several times as uh, being untruthful about. Um, and yet, I think when we talk about North Jersey values, we talk about growing our economy uh, for everyone. We talk about making sure that people are invested in. We talk about investing in our future and making sure that we, we lower taxes on families while at the same time investing in infrastructure so we can meet the critical needs of this district uh, and grow the jobs for the future so that our kids stay here and can get good jobs here. All right, this question is for both of you, starting with Mr. Weber. In an age of misinformation and disinformation, would you support the federal government stepping in to regulate social networks like Facebook and Twitter? I think we have to be very, very careful about that, uh, Michael. For as frustrating as it is to watch uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google uh, suppress opinions and thought, and uh, very often opinions and thought on the right, uh, I'd be most concerned about government trying to take a, a leading role in telling private entities what they can and can't uh, say or how they should run their, um, their operations. I think transparency is uh, a laudable goal. I have no problem with Congress calling uh, the leaders of Facebook and Google and, and Twitter uh, to Congress to testify, to explain their algorithms or to explain uh, why they're making the decisions they're making. I think the public uh, has an interest in that, uh, but I'd be very, very careful before we got the state involved with uh, determining what speech is acceptable and what uh, decisions uh, people are making around what our core First Amendment rights. Ms. Cheryl, your thought? Well, I believe in net neutrality, and I'm opposed to any uh, tax on net neutrality. But I agree, we really need to make sure we have transparency. I think one of the key things is understanding where information is coming from on the internet. So when we see um, trolls from Russia or China who's getting increasingly active in this area and people don't realize that that's, that's who's feeding them the information, uh, we, need to, we need to have transparency there so that we can, under, so people can choose where they're going to get their information and understand who's, uh, who's putting that information out. I think we've seen some very dangerous things uh, in people attacking our democracy in the last election cycle. And people need to be aware that that's happening and need to understand uh, how they're getting their news and where their news is coming from. Uh, federal regulation, yes, no? I'd be very cautious with, with the federal regulation. All right, this is our final question. It goes to Ms. Cheryl. President Trump tweeted of your opponent, quote, he is outstanding in every way, strong on borders, loves our military and our vets, big crime fighter. Jay has my full and total endorsement. What would you say in reply to Trump's tweet? Um, I would say that uh, I hope that uh, if he's excited about the 11th District of New Jersey, he gets some infrastructure spending here, that he makes sure that uh, we get quality and affordable health care for everyone in this country that we have a tax plan that invests in all states, not just a chosen few, um, and that we work hard to move this country forward. Mr. Weber, your comment on the Trump tweet, you, you were surprised by it, I, I read. Uh, that... Yeah, no, no one tells you from the White House, hey, something's coming. So it shows up on Twitter and you say, wow, thank you, Mr. President. Anytime if the leader of the free world wants to get involved in my congressional race and help me bring my vision of a more uh, prosperous, freer, stronger America, uh, to the voters of my district, I welcome it. I welcome the juxtaposition between Donald Trump's America, which is working and which is freer and more prosperous uh, than it has been in decades, and the Nancy Pelosi agenda that Mikey supports, uh, that she lauds and, and that she thinks Nancy Pelosi is an effective speaker. I think that's a great comparison. It's all the voters in this district need to know, and I think we'll be successful based on that. All right, it's time for your closing statements. We begin with you, Mr. Weber. Well, thank you, Mikey. Uh, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Mikey, for, uh, for your time. Uh, I want to ask the voters of the 11th Congressional District to think hard about where their vote will be cast uh, come November 6th. I'm a son of North Jersey. I was born here. I was raised here. I'm raising my family here. I started a business here. I understand the needs of this district, whether it's flooding in the Passaic River Basin or the uh, important priority that Picatinny Arsenal is to our North Jersey economy. I'm committed to providing the same opportunities that North Jersey, North Jersey gave me uh, as a young man 
and that North Jersey continues to give me and my family as they grow. Uh, the distinction in this campaign is quite simple. Uh, I am a forward-looking, optimistic, confident, hopeful candidate who wants to continue to have this economy grow and create opportunity for all. Mikey Sherrill is looking backwards, trying to dredge up old social issues to divide us with that identity politics that Michael had talked about, uh, looking to stoke controversy instead of address those issues at the kitchen table that everyone wants addressed. And so on November 6th, or if you're voting by mail, vote now. I'd like to ask for your vote to keep America moving forward, and to keep us prosperous and free. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Ms. Cheryl, your closing statement. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, NJTV, for having us here tonight. Thank you, Assemblyman Weber, for taking part in this debate. I began my service to this country when I was 18 years old and joined the Naval Academy. I went on to serve for almost 10 years in the United States Navy as a helicopter pilot and finally as a Russian policy officer. I served again here in New Jersey at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, after a lifetime of service, I decided the best way I could continue my service to my country and to New Jersey was to run for Congress. Because I'm not just concerned about what's happening now. I'm concerned about the future of New Jersey because I have four kids. And so I think we need to work in a bipartisan manner to get good legislation passed in Congress. A, a tax plan that doesn't attack New Jersey, uh, quality and affordable health care for everyone in this country, working hard to bring costs down in our health care system, infrastructure spending so we can grow our economy now and well into the future. Uh, I have always put this country first. I have worked with people from across the country and even across the world to get the mission accomplished. And quite frankly, Jay Weber hasn't. So I'm asking you for your vote, and thank you so much. All right, that's it. I want to thank you both, Mikey Sherrill, Jay Weber. Good luck to you both in the election. Uh, it's been a good and broad-ranging debate. Now let's hear a little more about it. I'm going to go back to my colleagues on the news desk. Thank you, Michael Aaron. Well, you've heard it. Democrat Mikey Sherrill, Republican Jay Weber, battle, battling back and forth by my count at least 16 major issues as they run for the 11th Congressional District. I'm going to go to Patrick Murray, your pollster first. Of all those issues, which are the ones that, in your experience, are bubbling to the top and really resonating with voters? The one issue on which persuadable voters, the few persuadable voters that we have left, are still kind of tentative is health care. And we heard them talk about health care today. What they're worried about is having the rug pulled out from under them, these voters. Um, that's why they wanted to hear things about uh, you know, pre existing conditions and so forth. Their concern is that they saw what happened when the Republicans tried to repeal Obamacare and they were worried about the chaos that would ensue from that. And that's why they are trending right now towards the Democrats, and I think that's helping Cheryl in this race right now. What Jay Weber needs to do, and what he tried to do tonight, certainly, is to win them back by you know, calming them down and saying, no, we're going to, with all those key things, we're going to, whatever we do with health care, we're still going to try to protect them. Any new ground, Patrick, as far as you can tell, they broke tonight? Uh, no new ground. I think that both of them were, were really on message tonight with what they tried to do. You know, the one thing that I, I think we heard come out of this is that, as I, I said, you know, at the top, is that it's all about these bread and butter issues. And they tried to, when they were pushing each other, they tried to push them into culture issues, whether it was sanctuary cities, whether it was conversion therapy, because they know that these are the issues that voters don't want to hear about, they don't want uh, right now. And, and Patrick, well, what do voters think when they hear one candidate call another candidate and accuse someone of lying? How do, how do voters typically respond to that? Yeah. Well, I mean, they don't like it unless, unless there's something to, to back it up with. But I, I think that, that they, I mean, what happened tonight was pretty tame by, by any imagination. I don't think there's, a, you know, the one thing is we know that people who watch debates live are the true believers already. The question is, was there anything that happened tonight that's going to bubble out into social media uh, to be the, in the news cycle? And I don't think so. I think both of them did a really good job at sticking to their talking points. Let's bring Brendan and Veronica into this conversation. Brendan, you represent Mikey Sherrill. Mm -hmm. What is Jay Weber's strongest argument tonight? What is Jay Weber's strongest argument yes. tonight? <laughs> um, listen, I think um, what Jay Weber tried to do was run away from his record because his record, uh, it's not his strongest argument, is what you saw continuously throughout the debate. 
um, you know, his record uh, is inconsistent with what mainstream New Jersey voters want. So he's, he's on the wrong side of the issue of choice. He's on the wrong side of women pay equity. He's on the wrong side of taxes. Uh, he is not in the mainstream. So uh, it's tough for me to say what is. So you pivoted his, away from that what question. What is strongest argument? Monica, <laughs> same question to you then. What you're saying, what Mikey Sherrill's strongest argument yes. was? Yes. Well, I think the strongest argument she tried to make was how she could divide NJ11 further. Um, and to uh, Brendan's point, uh, when it comes to Jay's record, the thing that he has m to be most proud of is the fact that Jay is not afraid to take votes on principle because he is not the kind of person that will go to Washington and worry about the next election. He's the type of person that's going to worry about what matters. And the biggest attack that I know my opponent loves to throw around is that equal pay vote. Anybody knows that has read that bill that was not about equal pay. Equal pay has been on the books in New Jersey for decades. It is a clear distortion of his record. Well, That's guess, what Mikey guess, Sherrill did well, I guess Well, I guess the assemblyman's <laughs> insulting the 78 members of the New Jersey Assembly who voted for it. So, because there's only two members of the Assembly who voted against it. Uh, so, it, so to the idea um, that uh, people didn't read the bill or didn't understand the bill. No, that's not what's going on at all. The bill was voted on the no, year no, 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 before, the, and the it idea, didn't pass no, no, when but, it had a but, different but, name. But I, I hear you, but let me just say this. This is, a again, a mainstream issue. And what Jay Weber has shown in the debate is that he chooses his ideological purity over doing what's in the best interest of New Jersey voters. The ideological purity of from, equal pay, which he supports. Let me move you both away from a culture conversation into a strategic one. Both your candidates have different disadvantages going in. Mikey Sherrill is going into a, a Patrick Murray can tell you, a, um, congressional district that is largely Republican and mm -hmm. has been in Republican hands since mm -hmm. 1985. Mm -hmm. no How question. does she overcome that? Listen, I think she's run a, a, um, a tremendous campaign up until this point. I, I think strategically you come into this uh, debate uh, with the idea that public polling is showing that uh, Mikey Sherrill is in the lead. Uh, to be in the lead at this point in a Republican district is a very good thing. Uh, so really the pressure, I, I guess what I'm suggesting is the pressure tonight was on Assemblyman Jay Weber, uh, not on not on Mikey Sherrill, uh, because Mikey Sherrill is further ahead of where she should be at this point in this particular district. Right, Jay, but Jay Weber's disadvantage is a financial one. Uh, Mikey is, is out uh, raising, out fundraising him. How does he overcome that? Well, I think he is overcoming it because as much as Mikey Sherrill has raised and spent over $4 million since that last poll was taken, nothing has moved. The needle hasn't moved because the message isn't resonating. Patrick can attest to that and knows that that How win that she has it? is within the margin of error. If the win is still within the margin of error, it's meaningless. This is a margin of error race. Jay's message okay. is resonating with the voters. And for all of the money that we have seen our opponent put towards this thing, and the fact that it is not connecting with voters, that it is not moving that needle. I've read a lot of polls. That is not a good poll for Mikey Sherrill. So mm -hmm. should Jay Weber be out uh, 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 ahead of Mikey Sherrill since this is a Republican district? Look, polling a primary is a difficult thing to do. Again, Patrick, not Patrick. trying to bring you into this, but it's true. <laughs> you poll a handful of people, you have a large margin of error. But at the end of the day, Jay Weber is out there knocking on doors, speaking to people. He knows what matters to those people. It's those kitchen table issues. It's the issues that unite us across the aisle. I don't care what our opponent wants to say. Jay Weber is a bipartisan leader. He has sponsored legislation in the Assembly with 90% of the Democratic 90% of the Democratic leaders in the Assembly. That's bipartisan leadership. I would just say, as a person who's run, I've, I've run quite a few campaigns um, here in this state. Um, you, uh, where we are in this race, uh, we would take in a heartbeat based on this district. Uh, this is a Republican district. Uh, the reason that you have seen uh, the fundraising numbers and the amount of money that uh, Mikey Sherrill has been able to raise as a challenger, it's a data point that shows her message is res resonating. You don't raise that type of money unless your message is resonating with rank and file voters. Yeah, let me say, you know, about the, the, this and what's going on in this race, what we've been seeing since Labor Day is we had an unusual level of Democratic enthusiasm over the summer, not just in New Jersey 11th, in every poll that we've been, uh, every district that we've been polling across the country. Mm -hmm. And after Labor Day, the Republican enthusiasm started catching up a little bit with, uh, with the Democratic enthusiasm. I, I think it was more natural than anything else. It was just a, a balancing. Uh, this is one district where the Democratic enthusiasm continues to outpace uh, Republican enthusiasm. I think if we were polling, if we expected that this electorate would look like every other midterm electorate in New Jersey that we've had in the past few years, I think Jerry Weber would be ahead. I, I think it's this difference in this year 
and it's based on some evidence that we've had from polling the special elections in, out in Pennsylvania and Ohio and Alabama this year that makes it a little more unpredictable in terms of these new voters coming into this fray who don't vote in midterm elections but are coming out, the, may be coming out this time. Uh, and Patrick, I'm curious about something. When, when, when uh, Kavanaugh was confirmed, uh, Mitch McConnell was talking about how uh, what uh, Kavanaugh was going through has kind of riled up the Republican base and in red states and other places. Uh, Republican voters have been energized by this. Are, ha have we seen any polling results to support that so far? An enthusiastic vote counts for one vote. An unenthusiastic vote counts for one vote. So whether the voters are energized or not, what we did see is a number of midterm Republican voters who have a history of voting in midterms but really weren't engaged over the summer becoming more engaged. I think part of that was Kavanaugh, but I think a bigger part of that was just naturally getting into the election cycle. So I really don't think, and we've actually polled this, and we polled it in this race, we found the vast majority of voters saying that Kavanaugh did not really change uh, their opinion at all. And there was a small number of voters who said basically that it motivated them slightly more, but it really didn't change the overall dynamic that, and the contours that so we've that, been seeing in this race. And all the more reason that I think that that helps the Cheryl campaign, because uh, you know, again, not to drag you in, Patrick, again, but your own poll uh, said that the Kavanaugh uh, right. hearings didn't really move people's opinions on this race. The, de the intensity in this race, based on both the primary turnout uh, and what you're seeing uh, across the country and in the district, is with the Democratic candidate. So the challenge is for the Republican candidate in this race uh, to create some intensity, and it does not look like the Kavanaugh hearings in this particular district are going to do that. We're going now to the spin room, as I understand it, and uh, the Democratic candidate for the New Jersey 11, Mikey Sherrill, is in there now. Let's see what she has to say. Is trying to constantly spin things. Uh, I'm a Navy veteran. I say what I mean. I have said on numerous occasions I don't want to abolish ICE. I have said on numerous occasions I'm not supporting Nancy Pelosi for leadership. I am not sure how to be more clear on that. And I expect the voters of the district to hear that and to know with my background and my record that I will stand by that. You never, you never mentioned, at least none of us heard you mention Donald Trump. Is that a specific strategy on your part to not mention the president in what is still considered a Republican district? No, it's not a specific strategy. Uh, you know, I have been around the district, and I'm happy to talk about um, issues that I agree with the president on and w issues that I don't agree with the president on. But uh, I think voters want to know what I could do for them in Congress, specifically for the 11th District of New Jersey. And so that's why I focus so much on taxes, health care, and infrastructure, because these are the things I'm hearing from the voters as I go around the district. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. From candidate Jay Weber in just a moment. During the debate, we have been conducting a survey and have had a list of poll questions that we've been asking people to weigh in on so far. Uh, one, of course, is who would you vote for? But another one that, that Patrick, you'll be interested in, was that of the, th of the issues that were the most important to them, the one that bubbled up to the top, was health care. And here are the poll results now, the NJTV Instant Online Viewer Poll. Which of the following is most important to you? Health care ranking at the top, they were 33%. Social issues, 22%. Immigration, 13 percent. Taxes, 61 percent. Yeah, that's the big one. 61. I think it's 16. I think it's 16. Environment, 19 percent. And the other yeah. is 6 percent. We'll correct We're that. We're going to double check that one. Double check that, right? That would be quite high. It's 61 percent. Yeah, but as I said, you know, health care is the issue for persuadable voters. But that tax plan is something. And I would think... I, I mean, I, I think it's 16, but it could be 61 because the people who are watching this debate right now, um, I think that would be very important to them. Um, you get, it's, it's, again, it's the persuadable voters, and, and the question is who do you Patrick, we have to go now to candidate Jay Weber in the spin room. Let's hear what he has to say. Pardon me. I clarified some important issues. Uh, the first one is that Mikey Sherrill is going to vote for Bob Menendez, which is uh, a very bold statement, uh, and, and I think it makes very plain. You can't both talk credibly about ethics in Washington and say you're going to cast your vote for Senator Bob Menendez. The two are just in, totally inconsistent. You can't give lip service to, oh, well, he should pay it back. By the way, 
I called on Mikey back in June to call on Senator Menendez to pay back those gifts, uh, and it took till what's this, October 10th, for her to get around to doing it. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Sherrill's uh, credibility on ethics is uh, completely shot uh, uh, with her support of uh, Bob Menendez. We have uh, now a candidate for Congress who is open to a carbon tax. Uh, the most overtaxed people uh, in the nation here in New Jersey are not going to like uh, that uh, their, one of their congressional candidates is open to heaping yet another tax on them. Um, and on that and, and so many other issues, I think the distinction was drawn between the candidates, and uh, I think the distinction was drawn f uh, favorably for us. You seem to go on the attack a lot and also to bring up issues that Michelle. You've been listening to candidate Jay Weber there in the spin room. Before him was Mikey Sherrill. We're going to go now to the poll, uh, NJTV instant poll. Who won this debate tonight on NJTV? There you see the results. Jay Weber, the Republican, 51 percent. Mikey Sherrill, the Democratic candidate, 49 percent. Next Wednesday, candidates for uh, the seventh con congressional district will be here. But before we get to that, we should say that there are Patrick Murray, the 51, 49 percent who won. Uh, thing 51 percent for Weber confirms what your uh, your um, my, my poll analysis. Said. I mean, I two things. It, it confirms one that, that your your audience was pretty evenly divided in watching this debate. But I think that really was. I mean, I think it was a pretty evenly divided debate. And how do you feel about tonight's debate, Brendan? Listen, I think um, I think Mikey distinguished herself uh, very well uh, in this debate. Um, you know, I think she laid out a clear vision of where she wants to take this district. Uh, she talked about her bio, which I think is very important. Monica, New candidate, different candidate, yeah, did well. Veronica? Oh, well, I think Mikey Sherrill did what we expected her to do, show us that she is a true blue Democrat. Jay Weber spoke about issues that unite us, that bring us together across the aisle, and will make New Jersey better for everyone. Veronica, Brendan, Patrick, thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Next Wednesday, candidates for the 7th Congressional District will debate right here on NJTV. Longtime Republican Representative Leonard Lance faces off against his Democratic challenger, Tom Malinowski. NJTV will be on the campaigns and have full coverage on the November 6th midterm elections. I'm Michael Hill. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all of us here, thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Major funding for NJ Decides Debate Night is provided by NJM Insurance Group. Disappointed with the way in which the Kavanaugh order few uh, campaign have characterized it better. Head of Bring up JTV will be on the campaign. Um, I did not hear. A I actually don't support the abolishment of ICE. Of ICE because I put my finger in the wind. The